Friends, if you would turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Psalm 46. We'll be ready when we arrive at that passage in our study in just a moment or so. We're going to work our way toward the text. Psalm 46. Before we do that, I have some business to take care of. Uh, Terry McDonald, who worked with our VBS this week, uh, they made me a special hat and dared me. You don't ever dare a pastor if I would wear it in the pulpit. And I kind of like it. I, I, think it, I think it's flattering to me, Lloyd. I think it looks good. I'm going to have to take it off because it's, it's restricting my free flow of upper motor neurons. I want to be able to think clearly. But I kind of like that. Plus, here's the good news. Terry said if you put that on, that she, she said she was going to double her offering this month in the month of June. I thought that was so kind of her. No, don't you? That's fantastic. There's Bob. Done. Thank you, Bob. Man, you married up, my friend. Listen, friends, I do want to take a moment and express my own sincerest gratitude to the 140 volunteers of you who made Vacation Bible School possible this past week. You gave your time each night. Many of you worked all day long and came and gave your life uh, and love that night, each night of the week, to make sure our children were exposed to the love of God in a way that was creative, imaginative, and, and reliable. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. In fact, if I can say it in a way that doesn't sound patronizing, if I can say it in a way that's not paternalistic, and I just say it this way, I was so proud of you as a church this week. I was proud of our students. Our students showed up in a big way this week and served our children and I just want to say this is one of the many reasons that I love you. And I just want to say thank you for serving your children this week. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Amen. We are in a sermon series now, the second part of which is today. A sermon series in which we're asking some big questions. Questions not unlike the kind of question that compelled Robert to move toward the waters of baptism. What is all this? What's the whole point? What is this thing that we do? And why do we do it? And last week, as we began a new sermon series that I'm calling Fruitful, I began with this premise. This is the premise. This is the point of the entire series. That the chief aim, and that's the next point, not, not quite yet. The chief aim, just listen, let it, let it settle on you. The chief aim and the end game of the Christian life is to become more and more and more like him every day that we live. To live so yielded to the power of God's love at work in us that we gradually mature into the very character of the God whom we see in the face of Jesus. I'm going to say that every week until it just sinks into the bones. The chief aim and the end game of the Christian life is to become more and more and more like him every day that we live. To live so yielded to the power of God's love working in our lives that we actually begin to mature into the very character of the God we see in the face of Jesus Christ. Athanasius, the 4th century bishop of Alexandria, put it this way. He became what we are so that in him we might become what he is. That's the chief aim and the end game of everything. The trouble with people like us is this. Even if we aspire to live like Jesus in the world, even if we aspire to become more like him and to bear the traits and the characteristics of our Lord in this world, which we are intended to do, our tendency is to simply go about that task by trying hard, by just giving it a mighty go, a mighty effort. I'll just try harder. I'll stop doing these things and I'll start doing these things. I'll, I'll quit that attitude and I'll take up this attitude as if we can strive our way to Christ's likeness. And what I said last week, I want you to remember, the secret to the Christ-like life is not in striving, but in surrendering. Let that just soak for a moment. 
The secret to the Christ-like life is not in striving, but in surrendering, in yielding so fully to the Spirit of God at work in our lives that we grow something in our lives that we can't possibly grow on our own. It's yielding to God's desire to grow something in us that we simply can't grow on our own. That's why we call it fruit. So the anchor verse of this entire study is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And last week we began studying that first fruit, love. But what I attempted to communicate last week was that love is not simply the first of nine fruits, but rather love is the root from which all the other eight fruits grow. And today I want us to focus a moment on joy joy. And I think maybe it's timely that we talk a minute or two about joy because I know people and you know people. I talk to friends and acquaintances all the time and I know you do too who are on the very brink of despair and they live a life of joylessness or at least go through seasons of joylessness. And if you're there today, if you're in a place where you can't remember the last time you experienced joy, I just want you to lean in for a little bit this morning because this message that God has placed on my heart may be specifically for you. But we got to begin with a, a bit of a definition. And man, definitions for joy are all over the map. They're everywhere. They're a dime a dozen. And all of them are imperfect. I mean, joy is one of those life experiences that seems to refuse to be confined to a perfect definition. And we attempt, and in attempting to preach this sermon, I, I, I just want to give you one more. <laughs> one more imperfect definition that I made up that I think, I think it nets out in the end. But I want to do it this way. I want to start with a definition so we all know what we're talking about. But if you'll allow me, can we do this definition in two parts? I want to introduce the first part of this definition and preach a bit about it, say some things about the first part of this definition. And then if you'll allow me, I'll come back around the other side of the barn and preach the other half and put it all together in what I hope will frame our minds and our hearts for a word from God. So first, the first half of my own imperfect definition of joy. Joy is the experience of profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. And we'll just stop right there for a moment. It is the experience of profound gratitude and contentment and delight. It's about simply looking at life and saying, this is good. This is good and I don't want it to, to end. It's about an experience where you're able to point to it and say, this is right, it's beautiful, it's good, it's lovely, and I want more and more of this thing. It is profound contentment about a thing. Profound gratitude and profound delight. Now, I know we spend a great deal of time in circles like ourselves talking about the difference between joy and what? Happiness. And we make, we make a point about that. We say that happiness is different than joy. We say that happiness is about circumstances. It's about what happens to you. You could be happy about what happens to you, but joy is deeper. And all of that is profoundly true. That is absolutely true. But sometimes I just don't know. Because there are some things that happen in life that fill me with a profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. And the trouble is, the Bible kind of confirms it. All through the Bible, there are different words that are used to describe the experience of joy. All through the Old and New Testament. 
And so many of them kind of blur the line between what you and I might call joy and what we might call happiness. Can I give you just a couple examples? So in the creation of the world, a story that begins our Bible, God makes a little bit of stuff, steps back, says that's good. He makes some more stuff, steps, it sounds a lot better if you read it, but, I, but he makes some stuff, steps back and says, that's good. And after seven cycles of making stuff, stepping back, he says, that's very good. That is profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. That is joy underway from the lips of the divine. If you were to go over to Psalm 65, Tim Mackey points out a rhythm here. Psalm 65 talks about its joy when a, when a shepherd's flock begins to multiply. Yeah. It's joy when a farmer's uh, crop begins to come into harvest. It fills them with joy, the text says, because now they know through their vocational endeavors they can feed their family, they can take care of their own, and it fills them with a deep sense of profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. In Psalm 104, put your seatbelts on for this one. Psalm 104 says, a good bottle of wine is God's gift to bring joy to humankind. At least, yeah, there's somebody, you're not supposed to amen that. So, but the truth is joy comes in different shapes and sizes. Is it any wonder why the very first miracle of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ was to turn empty coffers of beverage into more and more wine? Because the symbol is joy. That's all it is. Did you know that in Jeremiah we're told that marriage is what brings joy? joy when you sit at a wedding and you see these two people who are so in love and they have no idea what they're getting into and yet you see the the look on the man's face when he sees his bride for the very first time and and there is a sense of you can't you can't help but grin it's joy in Proverbs, we're told that it's joy that we experience when we watch our kids, when we watch our children just being kids, playing, sleeping, napping, making messes, and so on. We're even told that in another proverb that just as good perfume brings joy to the nose, seeing a friend come is like bringing joy to the heart. See, all those things are joyful, but they happen to be things that happen. And yet the same word is used in all of those contexts. The trouble is, you and I both know what the problem is. All of those things, without exception, every single one of them can go away. Every single one of them is fleeting. Can I just give you an example by working backward from what I just said? Friendships, though they bring joy to the heart, can fracture. Children, though they bring joy to the heart, can suffer and in watching your children go through a thing and suffer, that in itself is a suffering for you. A wedding that is so beautifully planned and it's gorgeous as it, as it is as it's pulled off. It's just an amazing moment. But marriages fail all the time, sometimes because we put so much work in preparing for the wedding and so very little work preparing for the marriage. It sometimes is fleeting. And she and harvests fail. Vocations that bring security and confidence and comfort to our family. Well, the job can bring joy, but the job can be lost. Amen? And, and, then, and then what? This is where this book comes back to our rescue. Because even though it points to places where you and I both know what it means to, to feel a, a, a sense of profound contentment gratitude and delight it also points to the reality that there is another kind of joy that withstands every loss and is not dependent upon the storms or the circumstances that you're facing can i give you an example or two i'll just preach a little further about this first half of the definition that we're using so the people of Israel are in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And God raises up a prophet in the name of Moses who delivers them into freedom. And they cross the Red Sea. You know this story. They cross the sea. And the very first thing they do in the wilderness 
is sing a song of what? Joy. Yeah. <laughs> and they, and they, they're in the wilderness. I mean, they haven't made it to the promised land. Promised land is miles away and years away. And yet in the wilderness, they, they sing a song of joy. They don't have shelter. They don't have food. They don't yet have water. There's no reason for them to be happy about it. But they sing a song of joy because despite their circumstances, they have encountered the love of God that has rescued them from bondage. Another example, generations later people of Israel are now in exile and in exile far from home in misery with no control over the outcome of their lives absolutely no control God raises up another prophet Jeremiah who who comes forward to proclaim to the people that your misery will soon be over that soon God will deliver you and restore the fortunes of all of your forefathers and foremothers. And, and th this will happen soon. And it filled them with what the text says is a great joy. But the trouble is they were still in exile. They were still, they had no idea when or who or where or why or what for or how it's going to unfold. They have zero control over anything in their lives, but they sang for joy, not because of the perceived control they have in life, but rather because of their trust in the God who has promised to take care of them. And right there, you move over into the New Testament and, and Jesus, after he's crucified and resurrected from the dead, he is seen by more than 500 of his followers who were filled with joy, so much so that they couldn't stop talking about it. They couldn't stop singing about it, despite the fact that the more they talked about it, the more they suffered. They were arrested, tortured, flogged. They were beaten and many executed because of their confession of faith. And yet, do you know we have stories of early Christians being burned alive while singing hymns of joy? How in the world is that even possible? It is only possible when you recognize that my deepest gladness, my most profound contentment is not in the outcome of the event that I'm navigating. It is in the holder of this life, the one who rescues me from the outcome. And right there is time for the second half of our definition. You know the first half. The first half is joy, is the experience of profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. And the second half is this. In the providence of God, despite our circumstances. Joy is the experience of profound contentment, gratitude, and delight in the providence of God. Despite our circumstances, it is found in trusting the goodness of God to carry me through this season that I, A, don't know how will end, and B, have no control over it whether I did know how it ended or not. It's a profound trust in the goodness of God to deliver. Now, this past week I was thinking about where is the best example to demonstrate in Scripture what it looks like to be in a profound crisis and yet have a profound joy. And strange as it sounds, it's as if the Lord dropped Psalm 46 right in my lap. Psalm 46 verse 1, God, by the way, a city under siege, a city under attack, at war, chaos on every direction. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though its mountains tremble at its tumult. There is a river whose streams, watch this phrase, make glad the city of God, that phrase in Hebrew is a phrase that means rejoice. That phrase in Hebrew, is, it means to make joy. To make joy. Chaos looming every direction. City under siege. And yet there is something in this city under attack that can make joy. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. Some of us in this room 
could describe our lives as a city under siege. Attacked on every side. And, and yet you've heard the old, you've heard the old verse, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes when? In the morning. But you know what? I can't mess with scripture. Sometimes I, I wish last week I added a colon in a place where I shouldn't have added a colon. But I wish I could because you know why? You know, clearly that verse that we all know, uh, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In other words, joy comes when the sun rises tomorrow in the a.m., in the morning. But sometimes I like to play with it. I think that sometimes weeping may endure through the night, but joy comes in the M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, in the morning. Because it's only in the seasons of deep, authentic mourning do we realize the grace of having tears wiped from our face by the God who is in the midst of the city? Come on. And the text continues. The nations are torn. They are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. And I just want somebody here who is going through a joyless life, a season of joylessness where it feels as if your very kingdom is tottering. I want you to understand all it would take is for him to utter his voice and the earth could melt. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. I love this part. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still. Be still. You realize this verse right here that I just read is the only verse where God speaks in this passage. It's all about the psalmist talking about life falling apart, city under siege, kingdoms tottering. He's like, oh, all these things happen. And the sea, it roars and foams and it's tumult. No, the, the mountains are shaking and quaking. And look at God. Well, he makes wars to seas. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear, burns the shields. And God interrupts with, be still. Like right now. Shh, and no, I am your God. It might simply be that we are so in uproar about the tumult of our lives, about the trouble of our lives, that we fixate on trying to find our own way to joy, and it's just more noise and more tumult, and God says, be still, and no. In fact, I don't think that you can know until you be still. Be still a minute and understand, man, this thing, this world was turning before you came into it. It'll be turning when it's after, when you're done living in this world. But the whole while that you've been in it, you've been held by the hand of God. I I think, I think I could keep reading. I just want to say something else though. I, I think that so many of us experience lives of joylessness because We assume that our circumstance has to be behind us before we know joy. I mean, just as soon as I get this different job, it'll be fine. As soon as, you know, as soon as I get married, it'll be fine. As as soon as we're out of debt, then I can relax and we'll be joy. As soon as I purchase this thing and do the other thing, as soon as my loved one is cured, as soon as my friend is sober, as soon as I lose my last five pounds that just won't seem to melt off, come on, right? You see, we worry about everything from the profound to the really mundane, and we think that all that stuff has to be in place before we can experience profound contentment, gratitude, and delight. And I'm telling you, we don't. I think that some of us experience joylessness, not because we think all those things have to be behind us, but while they're with us, we attempt to manufacture our own joy. We, we, we try to manufacture our own joy by, by uh, I don't know, by saying yes to the 10,000 imitations that get streamed to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and promise much and deliver nothing. And I just want to say to somebody here, true, authentic joy cannot be live streamed, downloaded, or double clicked on Amazon with next day delivery. I'm here to tell you that joy is something more, prof- it's better than that. It is a profound, profound contentment 
and gratitude and delight in the providence of God, despite our circumstances. And yet I think some of us, we don't experience joyless or joy. We don't experience joy in this life, not because we're waiting for it to get behind us, not because we're manufacturing our own. But if you're like me, I sabotage my joy. I'll be in the moment of pure delight, pure joy. And while I'm there, are you like me? I'm thinking to myself, well, this won't last long. Don't get too excited. Don't get too comfortable because sooner or later, the other shoe is going to drop. And so I shouldn't let myself get too happy or too joyful about this thing happening. You know, Brene Brown talks about that. She said it's kind of like this. Where she goes to speak, she asks the audience, and I'll ask you the same thing right here. How many of you under, know the experience of standing over either your own baby's bed or your grandbaby's bed? How many of you know standing over that crib, watching them sleep, and feel this overwhelming sense of awe and profound delight and gratitude and contentment at the beauty of perfection that we see there if they are our own. You know, how many of you have ever leaned over a bed and felt that way about the baby you're looking at? Yeah, lift them high. Right, yeah. How many of you at the exact same time while leaning over them in pure delight, pure joy and gratitude over what God has given you are at the same time simultaneously catastrophizing about everything that could go wrong with this baby. They could get sick. They could get hurt. I haven't heard them make a noise in about an hour or less 15 minutes. I'll go back and check. Are you still breathing? You know, because we sabotage our joy when we allow ourselves to experience joy in the one moment, but then we're just waiting for the other shit. It can't be that good. It can't be. It cannot be that good. Something's going to fall apart. I'm doomed. <laughs> See, I'm talking to somebody who knows what I'm talking about. I can tell. And, I'm, and in that moment, maybe joy is choosing to refuse to wait for the other shoe to drop. To look at your life as the miracle that it is. And, and this is why I want to say it this way. Joy is a decision. Joy is a decision. Now, remember what I said earlier and last week when I said, hey, hey, the Christ-like life, the secret to the Christ-like life is not in striving, but in surrendering. Well, it's the same thing with joy. It comes only in learning to surrender to the unseen hand of God at work in your life for your good. You can't control it. You can't predict it. You can't move his hand faster like you would a mouse on your computer. You can't slow it down. It is surrender. Surrender to the power of God's unseen hand and believing with a trust in your heart that he is out for your good. Some of us think that God is out to get us. And I'm here to tell you, God's not out to get you. God's out to get you. Yeah? Yeah. I wonder what it looks like to make a decision for joy. I've heard for my whole life, I've heard preachers talk about, yeah, joy is a decision. It's a choice. I choose joy. But I'm like, how? how? Tell me how. Because the thing I'm going through, I'm going through seven shades of hell, and you're asking me to choose joy. How? And I want to take an attempt at suggesting how. It's found in the words that are used for joy. In the New Testament, here's a word for joy. It's kara. It's on your screen. That's the Greek word for the word joy, kara. But kara, now follow me. You're going to have to lean in on this one. Y'all come here. <laughs> Y'all come here. Listen, lean in. Kara means joy. But kara has a root that is shared with another word in Greek, charis, which means grace. But kara and charis both share a root with a bunch of other words, including this word, eucharisteo. Eucharisteo, which means to give thanks, to be thankful, to have gratitude. And I'm suggesting to you, just watch. Look, can you, can you see it? Can you see the core? 
threaded. Can you see the, the root of each word threaded together? It's because they are mutually dependent upon one another. These are triplets. They were born together in the womb of God's joy. Here it is. Joy. Let's go back. This one doesn't have a slide. I'm just going to hit him with something else, Gene. Joy is what naturally emerges when we learn to see all of life as grace and make a deliberate decision to be thankful for it. I'm just going to repeat it again because I want it to sink down into the bones. Joy is not something we manufacture. It's a fruit. That means it grows from something. And what does it grow from? It grows from learning to see all of your life as grace. And when you see your life, every bit of it as grace, and choose every day to wake up and be grateful for every last drop of grace that is soaked into your life, you know what it does? It creates a kind of profound contentment. When I can name the grace, when I can trace the grace of God in my life, it makes me profoundly grateful. And my profound gratitude over a thing, guess what it produces? More joy. And then guess what the joy does? It makes me see the grace even better than I saw it before. And guess what the grace does? It compels me to be thankful for it. And guess what the thankfulness compels? More grace. You see how it works? So how do you make the choice of joy? How do you make it a decision? By being thankful for what you have. And it begins with understanding that every bit of life is grace. Every bit of it. You're like, well, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. And you don't know, like I said, the seven shades of hell that I'm having to navigate. How are you going to talk to me about be thankful? How can you be thankful for a painful season? Well, let me tell you. You let the words of James embrace you. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you enter into various kinds of trials and temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that it matures you and you are lacking in nothing. How do you make joy a choice? See your life as grace, every bit of it. And if you have a hard time seeing the grace in your life, I ask you to do this one exercise. Think of what you had in your life 11 months before your birth. What were you driving? What was your income? What brought you happiness? What relationships were you in? What was your status? How many followers? Every breath you breathe is borrowed from God. The first one, the last one, and this one. What would happen if you woke up every morning and said, God, thank you. I know I've got stuff today. I've got to thank you. Thank you mm, for this first breath of recreating me in this day. Thank you, Lord, for running water. I'm going to take a shower. (laughs) Thank you, God, for this towel that was washed in an electric washer. (laughs) And that it smells so fresh, like bounty freshness. Because I thank you, God, for the softness of the fibers. of. Thank you, God, for a table around which I can eat breakfast if I so chose. Thank you, God, for options in that breakfast. Thank you, God, for transportation to come to church. God, thank you that every time I come to church, Fred Henderson is there to welcome me and remind me that this is a good life. As long as he has lived, he understands. Thank you, God, for a place in which I can come and see a man stand in the waters of baptism and say, I was at the very bottom and I could not carry the burden anymore. And he took it away from me. Thank you, God, for the reminder that the hymn that we sang is so true. Our God saves. So thank you, God. I thank you, God, for, for Noah and David Range sitting right here. These boys whose voices are as sweet as angels. Now, don't let that go to your head, right? But I'm telling you, there's nothing better than to hear children remind you our God saves. Thank you, God. 
for something that is bigger than my circumstance. Thank you, God, for this moment right now, right here with these others who love you, who struggle alongside me. Thank you, God, that all of my hope and my deepest joy is grounded in a relationship with you and in nothing else. Amen. And that's why it may be that right now is the moment of decision for somebody today. For somebody today, it's time for you to decide to surrender your life to Jesus. To yield your life to the power of God's love to bring a transformation in you that could never be manufactured on your own. That's why even right now, our pastors are moving to the front of the sanctuary as they will be prepared to receive you at the conclusion of this benediction. We will be standing here waiting to listen to you, to talk to you, to pray with you, because it may be that somebody here today needs to surrender your life to the authority of the universe this very day. It may be that today you've been walking with him for a long time, but you've been walking with him holding his hand with one hand and clinging to every control in your life in the other hand. Maybe today is the day that you relinquish and put both hands in the nail-scarred hands. Maybe today is the day that you say, look, I've been doing this okay by myself for a while, but it gets a little bit lonely. And you follow the example of Robert who stood in the waters and said, I don't have to be alone. I've got a church family and it's time for you to join the fellowship of this church today. Whatever the decision may be, I pray that you don't wait another moment. That at the conclusion of this benediction, you knock people over getting down to one of the pastors. Just knock them down. We'll pick them up. But now it's time for every one of us to do the most important thing, to turn this gathering into a scattering where we go and live deliberately in this world in such a way that proves to the world we actually believe everything that we've affirmed in this place. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet for the benediction? Beloved, I pray that you know the fullness of the joy of the Lord by surrendering your life to him in every conceivable way. And wherever it is that you go from this moment, I pray that Christ goes before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in, and they will, to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear but mostly may Christ go in you transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his <laughs>